Well, my name is Dave Chafee. Um, I'm a pastor uh, with Agents for Christ Ministries. I'm the director of 10th Hour Project with them. Um, Agents for Christ it comes from 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. It says we are his ambassadors. Amen. The Bible talks about the greatest trade in the world, that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And that should just, you should be in awe of that every day, that God would trade your sin for his righteousness. He took on all your sin on that cross. He nailed it there. And then he gave you a robe of righteousness. His righteousness. Does that blow your mind? Man. And that one day you'll be in glory with him if you've been saved, if you've been redeemed. Not if your uncle's a pastor. <laughs> but if you've been saved personally, you will be in heaven with him. And he won't see a stain on you. He'll see you cleansed, washed new because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because you're wearing his righteousness. That should blow your mind. And so we want to be those representatives. We want to be his ambassadors, right, for the kingdom of God. We want to tell others about that. So we started this ministry about 13 years ago. Uh, I started with two families, uh, my family and Bill James and his wife and, and their family. Um, it was actually Bill felt the call of the Lord to be um, missionaries to the United States, which is interesting, uh, and, he, and he shared that with me. He was radically saved. Uh, was a, he was a cop, um, and he was a dirty cop, so he was busting drug dealers and then doing the drugs himself. That's not a good thing, uh, and all the while, he was serving in church as a children's ministry leader, so he was uh, what you call a hypocrite, right? But he wasn't saved, and so he was just trying to play the game, and God got a hold of his life radically when he uh, went to a door um, actually to put drugs back because he knew he was going to get caught. Um, and the guy that answered the door put a gun to his head, pulled the trigger, didn't go off. Um, and through that experience, he said, okay, God was saying, you know, man, I, I, you're done. You're done playing games with me, and it's time to surrender your life. And he did and went through Teen Challenge, got radically transformed and came, came home. And uh, he just was on fire and just said, you know, what? we need to go start sharing the gospel everywhere we can. That lit my heart back on fire because I was kind of lukewarm doing the church thing, you know. And uh, God lit my heart on fire through evangelism. And we began to do that. And go, he said, you know what, Dave, I think God's calling us to uh, sell everything we own, quit our jobs, buy a couple RVs, and just go across the country sharing Jesus. And I said, oh, he's, sharing, he's telling you that. He's not telling me that. Um, and it was crazy because, you know, I prayed about a lot about it. And, you know, it's was, it was funny that my wife, she really caught the vision ahead of time. And you know, when your wife sees it, um, you're a little bit delayed, guys, sometimes. We're just not seeing stuff. And so I knew that God was working um, through that. And we did. We, we sold everything we owned. We bought a couple RVs. And we just said, Lord, wherever you want to send us, we want to we wanna go share the gospel. And through that, we, we said, you know, we should form a nonprofit. And we should, you know, just start a ministry, actually. So we formed a, an evangelism class. And we began teaching that class um, it was interesting because we sent 400 letters across the United States saying who we are. We got four responses. I was like, okay, and it was just a little uh, of a trail. And as we started in faith, just going to those ch churches, one of them even wrote us a letter and said, hey, you probably want to go to the, uh, a bigger church or something because we don't have any money, and uh, we'd love you to come, but we can't do anything for you. I'm like, praise God, we want to come. <laughs> we don't care if you have anything. We just want to be a blessing. Um, and from there, God just really began to move in a powerful way and the the ministry just started to expand and we did that for three years we actually toured the united states for three years with our families sharing the gospel um, and teaching others to do the same just conversational evangelism um, and as we did that the lord just opened doors for us we we started a gospel track ministry just little cards with the gospel on it uh, we started making those for our own, ourselves and then people were like we we'd like to have those and so we started a website now we're shipping them all over the world we started a radio ministry, just a one-minute tip to um, help you share the gospel called Evangelism Minute, and that's played all over the country. And um, it's just been amazing what God has done. Uh, but after three years on the road, we, and we actually came here. It was one of our first stops when we first started this ministry. I was just talking to a young lady earlier about that, and um, she was saying, yeah, I remember you guys coming and uh, doing an evangelism class and then going out and sharing the gospel in the park. And it was a beautiful time. So we're glad to be back. It's been a while, probably about eight, nine years since we've been back. Uh, but over those years, uh, 
about three years into it, uh, my pastor gives me a call and says, hey, Dave, I want, I want you to pray about coming on staff. And so as we were praying, you know, our kids were getting too old, too big to fit in the RV. And it was just things were changing, you know, and uh, the Lord led me back to home to Calvary Chapel, Portland, where I was on staff for eight years. During that time, the James family went over to Uganda, and that ministry has just exploded. It started with literally two little Walmart tents on a hill. We got some property over there, and uh, Bill and his wife, and actually my dad, who was 72 years old at the time, went over there living in tents, just trusting God's going to build something. And through uh, much prayer, um, the Lord has built a mission center over there. We started Calvary Chapel Ishunga over there. Um, we started a school. We have over 300 kids in our school now, a sponsorship program for kids. Um, we built a medical center over there, and now we're building a high school. And we want to see these kids raised up in Jesus from kindergarten, right, through, through their high school years. And, and it's just been amazing um, to see what God has done over there. But over the last three years, my wife and I um, felt the call again to go into mission field, and we came back with Agents for Christ, and we started the 10th Hour Project. And the 10th Hour Project is a gap year for young adults. It's a, it's a mission training. It's eight months long. And get them saturated in the gospel before they do anything else, right? Before they go to university, uh, before they go into a career. Get them grounded and rooted and unashamed of what they believe and able to defend it. Amen? As the culture grows darker, we should be brighter. And we should be unashamed of the gospel. And so... That's been our mission for the last three years. Um, the 10th Hour Project comes from John chapter 1, um, verses 35 through 39. So that's where we're going to be today. I want to go through those verses today with you guys and uh, just really kind of give you a, an idea and a picture of the call of Christ, right? The call of Christ is to abandon all, and I pray that you understand that. Um, he doesn't want Sundays and Wednesdays. <laughs> He wants your life, and it's the greatest thing you could ever do is surrender everything that you are to Jesus Christ. It's the greatest place you'll ever be. So let's, let's uh, get into the Word of God, shall we? I want to start in, like I said, in verse 35, John chapter 1. It says, again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came, and they saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Your word, Lord, transforms our hearts and our minds and our lives. It brings hope and peace. It brings eternal life. And we can have eternal life just simply by putting our trust in Jesus, the living God. And we're so thankful for that today. So, Lord, as we look at your word, we pray that you would do the work that only you can do in this place. That every person here is divinely appointed to be here. You brought them here, whether they know it or not. And you wish to do a work in each heart. You desire to save people if they're not saved, to help them realize that they are sinking in a pile of sin on their way to perish in hell. And they need a Savior. And you're so, so loving. You want to save each soul. You want to save every person. And for the saints in here, Lord, we, we pray that they are encouraged, Lord, that they are unashamed, that they would live only for you and you alone. They would not live in fear, but they would live in a boldness. For your word says that the righteous are as bold as lions. And that doesn't come from ourselves. As we talked about earlier, that, that robe of righteousness is yours, and you give it to us. And may we be bold, God, in these last days to live for you and you alone. So, Lord, do the work that only you can do in each heart. Some may need encouragement. Maybe they're depressed. They're anxious. Maybe they're worried. They're doubtful. Meet them there. Some may need to be rebuked. Maybe they're living in sin. Maybe they're just ignoring your voice 
and they need a rebuke. That's the Spirit's work, not mine. It's only what you can do in each heart. So, Lord, meet us all here. You know the number of hairs on our heads. You know us infinitely. You know us eternally. And there's nowhere we could go to hide from you. But, Lord, today we don't want to hide from you. We want to say, Lord, search our hearts and remove anything that's not of you that you might be glorified in our lives today. So we give you all the glory, all the praise. We thank you for your Holy Spirit in this place. And let us live for you, Lord, in these last days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we see in this, this text here that the, uh, this is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. Um, but we need to give some context here. Okay, so John begins his gospel with the deity of Christ. And that is his focus throughout this book. And it's distinct from the other three gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are referred to as the synoptic gospels. Because they're similar styles, content, and because they give a synopsis of the life of Christ. Now, the book of John was actually what someone gave me before I was saved. I wasn't raised um, in a Christian home. A little bit of my testimony, I was raised in an alcoholic home. Uh, both my parents are major alcoholics. Uh, my brother was a drug dealer. Um, just a mess. And I didn't have anything of the gospel um, in my life in, or in my house um, and I was partying, you know, I started drinking at 10 years old, um, doing the drugs and alcohol thing, and uh, my life was a wreck, and one of my buddies got, actually gave his life to Christ, and I saw the transformation in his life, um, and I always talk about, you know, I, I hated religious people. I didn't know that people could have a relationship with God, so anybody that said something about God was religious to me, and you need to get away from me. <laughs> I just don't want to deal with you, you know, and uh I just thought they drank the Kool-Aid and they're weird. And the weird thing is that they're always happy a lot of times. They're just smiling all the time. It's like, what is wrong with you, man? Get the smile off your face. Don't you live in the same world I do? This place is horrible, <laughs> you know? And the only time I smile is if I'm high. Uh, but he, he got radically saved and uh, he was happy. <laughs> man, joyful, man, you know? Joy. He had joy. And uh, I would just say, dude, you've got to cut this out, man. You need to come party with us again. And he's like, bro, Jesus changed my life. And I was just, oh, man, you got issues, man. <laughs> but he said, you know what, here, he gave me a gospel of John. He said, I, you know, I challenge you to read it. Read this and see what, see what you know, just see what it says. And I, I wanted to read it just to show him how stupid he is. Um, but as I began to read the words of Christ, man, it changed my life. I, I had all these preconceived ideas of who Jesus is, and I didn't really understand who he was until I began to read his word for myself, and God radically began to change my life. Praise God for that, amen? And so the book of John, it's beautiful, isn't it? So John starts his gospel with bearing witness to the fact that Jesus is not only Savior, but that he's God. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John sets the stage here. Jesus is the living Word of God. Now when it says beginning here, it means the origin or the active cause. So Jesus is the uncaused cause. So let that blow your mind again, that Jesus created everything. We see his fingerprints across the universe, right? He literally made everything that there is, seen and unseen. John 1.10 says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. So God, the God who made everything that is material and immaterial, came into his creation. Not only did he make it all, but he condescended. He came to meet you. John 1.14 says, And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I love that. Jesus was the perfect picture of what a man should be. He's full of grace and truth. Listen, if you have too much truth, you're just beating people over the head with a Bible, right? If you have too much grace, all you are is a nice guy. <laughs> but you have to have grace and truth, right? You have to love people enough to tell them the truth, right, with grace. Jesus was that. He came into his creation. He condescended. Listen, there is no other religion that can tell you that, that God came to meet you where you're at. 
So John is giving us a theology lesson here. Jesus is God in the flesh. Listen, he was the perfect man. He never sinned. He came and lived perfectly because you couldn't, because <laughs> I couldn't. He came and lived the perfect life. Just as Adam should have, Jesus did it. And not only did he that, he went to a, a cross where he, un, he was undeserving of that cross, right? He was innocent. And he said, no, no, man lays, no man takes my life for I lay it down. And why did he do it? For you, for me. He was God in the flesh. Listen, there's a lot of people out there who will tell you different things. There's cults out there, right? The Mormons will tell you that he's somehow the spirit brother of Lucifer. That is a lie. No, he's not. You don't find that in this book. They say that he was once a man before he was God. That's blasphemy. Because the Bible says that God is everlasting. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He has no beginning. He has no end. He's God. And Jesus is that representation on earth. Jehovah's Witnesses will say that maybe he's Michael the archangel and then somehow turned into Jesus. I don't know. Don't bother. <laughs> Later we see that John the Baptist um, is clearing the way here in, in, in this first chapter of John. He's clearing a path for Jesus. In verse 23 he says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. So John is making a way here for Jesus to come, to present. He's doing a baptism of repentance, right? He's saying, get your heart right. You know, cleanse yourself so that you might see the Messiah. John is the forerunner for Jesus, and he's actually Jesus' cousin. And before they were both born, John jumped in the womb when Mary visited his mom, Elizabeth. Isn't that amazing? It says that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. She was in awe of the fact that she was in the same room with Jesus as he's in the womb. And then her baby, John, is jumping in the womb because of Jesus is next to him, close to him. Now, if that's not an argument for pro-life, I don't know what is. God has a call on your life before you're born. He knows everything that you're going to do in this life. He loves you. And here we see that John, he tells the people to get your heart right before God, that you will recognize Jesus when you see him. And so Jesus comes to John to be baptized. The Holy Spirit comes down upon Jesus, and John proclaims Jesus to be the Lamb of God. Now why? Why would he call him a lamb? Well, if you know anything about the history of Israel, every year they would sacrifice a lamb, right, for the sins of the nation, Right? Because the Bible says that without, remi without, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Right, Because we all deserve death. Right, One lie, the Bible says, have you ever told a lie? You're separated from God eternally. And so there's a problem there, right? And Jesus came to solve that problem. But for centuries, they would sacrifice doves, goats, lambs, right? For the, for the remission of sin. But notice this, it only covered sin. It only covered sin. You know, I, I see people all the time walking around, just they have a look of guilt or sadness or depression or just this weight, right? And that's because every human being has it. There's no way to lift it off yourself. There's, the only way is to let the blood of Christ cleanse you and give you a new heart. And so Jesus, here he is, the Lamb of God coming. And John sees it. He says, that, behold, the Lamb of God. It makes me think of Revelation too, right? Because in Revelation, <laughs> he's a whole different type of Lamb, right? He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's going to open those scrolls, the Bible says. John's weeping in heaven. He's saying, who's worthy to open the scroll? And it's Jesus, the Lamb of God, Right? Praise God that the Lamb of God that came doesn't just cover your sin. He removes it from you for all eternity, cleansed, free. And so that brings us to the text here. This is the, um, after John had baptized Jesus and after Jesus had returned from the temptation in the desert. In verse 35 here it says, again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And so he sees Jesus again, and he proclaims him to be the sacrifice of God for all humanity, that Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God, blameless, spotless. Now listen, I can only imagine what John's face might have looked like as he gazed upon Jesus. Think about this. 
This is the consummation of his ministry. I mean, he, this is his whole life. He's been waiting for Jesus to come. This is his whole call. We've seen it before. Even in the womb, he was being called to make this path for Christ to come, right? And he's doing these baptisms in the desert. People think he's crazy. I don't know if he had dreadlocks or what. He's out there eating locusts, sleeping in the desert, just baptizing people, saying, get ready, man. And here it is. This is the whole thing for him, right? He sees Jesus. And it must have blown his disciples away. Listen, John had disciples. They followed him everywhere he went. As a rabbi, you had students that live with you, right? And they go everywhere you go. And here's his disciples. They've invested their whole lives in John, right? They're there. They're, they're following him. And I'm sure he's told them, look, there's one coming that's going to be greater than me. And, and when you see him, that's it. Go. <laughs> Follow him, right? It must have blown them away. As they see John, okay, this is it. And verse 37, it says, The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. The two were Andrew and more than likely the apostle John, who's writing this book. But look at that immediate response there. It says, The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. <laughs> that's it. I mean, that's, there's a lot there, guys, right? They didn't say, Are you sure, John? Um, can I go get my bags? Uh, uh, isn't this program three years or, you know, they just saw Jesus and they went. Listen, this is the common response um, when God reveals Jesus to someone, right? When he opens the eyes of your heart to see who Jesus is. You might have, you know, a story of Jesus. You might have read some words of his, but have you seen him like that? Because if you've seen him with heavenly eyes, with, with your eyes open to, to who he is, you're going to drop everything to follow him. I love what A.W. Tozer says about this. He says, believing then is directing the heart's attention to Jesus. It is lifting the mind to behold the Lamb of God and never ceasing that beholding for the rest of our lives. Is that where you're at? I love that. And not only for the rest of our lives, for all eternity. You're going to behold Jesus, your Savior, your friend, the one who did it all for you. Thank you, God. Let us behold Jesus even more today than we did yesterday, guys. Let us see him. What about you? Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen the Lord? Or are you just too busy looking at your phone or looking at the screen, watching Netflix? or Instagram, or whatever, social, t take your social media, whatever you want. Have you seen him? Has he, has he grabbed your gaze? I pray that he has. Verse 38 here says, Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, he said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, Teacher, where are you staying? Now I love this scene here. Jesus asks, what do you want? One commentator said this about it. It was, the, no, it was not an accident that the first words the master spoke in his messianic office were his profoundly significant question, what do you seek? He asks it of us all today. He asks us all, what do you want from me? What do you want? What are you seeking? He wanted to know where they were really, where they were at, what they were actually seeking. Like, so, some people look to Jesus for money. Some people want physical healing, right? And that's okay. I mean, it's, that's not bad. But do you want Jesus himself? Is that your goal? To have him. See, Jesus isn't interested in people. He's interested in them. But he doesn't want people that just want miracles. He wants everything you are. You realize that that was his goal, to win you. He wanted to win your heart. Listen, he also warns that it won't be easy to follow him. In Matthew 16, 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Listen, it's in surrender that we find joy. This, is, this doesn't make sense to the world, right? It's to give up your life and surrender your life and take up that cross that Jesus calls you to carry. It's not easy. But it's the best life there is to serve people, to love people, to be about others, right? 
the acronym JOY, J-O-Y. First it's Jesus in your life, then others, and then yourself, and then you will have joy if you live your life in that order. Who's invited to follow Jesus? Well, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, this yoke is talking about, it's like a big wooden collar they would put on oxen, right? And they would be yoked together. They'd be tied together. And one of them was usually older than the, the other one, and it's pulling along the other one. And Jesus is saying, look, tie yourself to me. I mean, who's invited? The ones who are heavy laden, burdened, stressed out, anxious, fearful, right? That's me. I'm, I'm a good candidate. Sign me up, Lord. I want to be your disciple. Although the road won't be easy, listen, it'll be filled with his peace. And so we see in the text that Jesus wanted to know their motivation here. And what is their response? The rest of verse 38, Rabbi, which is to say, teacher, where are you staying? Immediately they wanted to be where Jesus is. So they're leaving John the Baptist, and there's, a, there's an immediate surrender to Christ here. I love what Oswald Chambers says. He says, in our abandonment, we give ourselves over to God just as God gave himself for us. Without any calculations, the consequences of abandonment never enter into our outlook because our life is taken up in him. It's like, God, whatever you want for me, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I'm yours. This abandonment, the, they desire to know him and be with him, not just know about him. How many people have head knowledge of Jesus? But it never makes its way to their heart. That's the farthest path to heaven, about 18 inches from your head to your heart. They want to know him. Verse 39, said, he said to them, come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying. And they remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. Now I love this scene here. Jesus invites them to know him. Listen, it's at the end of the day. I'm sure he's probably tired. Um, you know, they walked everywhere <laughs> during that, that time. Um, if it was me, it's the end of the day and I'm walking home and a couple guys are following me, I'd be like, uh, what do you want? I'll talk to you tomorrow. But he loves them, right? He sees them and he says, come and be with me. Come and see who I am. He invites them to know him. And it's an immediate response to a, a, a relationship, right? He's, he's inviting them to, into a relationship with him. Think about that. The God of all the universe wants to have a relationship with you. That should blow your mind. I know we hear it every, all the time in church. It's about a relationship. But we scratch our heads and go, what does it mean? Until you experience it in your own heart, that total surrender. And I know that Jesus is saying much more than come and see where I live. He's saying, come and see your sins forgiven. Come and see the purpose of your life. Listen, there is no purpose to life outside of God. What is the purpose of life if there is no God? Nothing. You're a vapor and then you're gone and so what? Morals don't matter. Nothing matters unless there's a God. And he's saying, come, see the purpose of your life. Come and see love, joy, peace, only found in Christ. He invites us as well. Come and see who Jesus is. It says they remained with him that day, and now it was about the 10th hour. And so this, this is the end of the day. Like I said, the closer to the end of the day, Jesus still wants to meet with them. Listen, any time that you call upon the name of the Lord, he'll be there for you. He desires to meet you. He desires to be with you. He desires to save you, redeem you, walk with you. The other thing here is that John remembers the exact time that he followed Jesus. It was about the 10th hour. Now, have you experienced your 10th hour? I pray you have. He tells you to come and see. Hebrews 3, 7, and 8, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. Listen, you don't know if you have tomorrow. You could walk out these doors and, and die. I don't know. No one knows the days that they have. And today is the day of salvation for you. If you haven't received Christ, receive him today. Jesus calls you to hear his voice. Don't harden your heart. Today, let that be your 10th hour if you haven't had it already. Amen? Let that be a surrender. That's a, a point of totally surrendering all to Christ. And that's where we, we've, we wanted to, this, this program that we started to be, that total surrender, the 10th hour project, we call it. 
Um, it's our prayer that it is a place uh, where these students learn total surrender to Jesus. Uh, it's an eight-month live-in discipleship program for young adults ages 18 to 26. We focus on theology, apologetics, evangelism, and missions. And from day one, we're sharing the gospel when they hit the ground. They spend three months in intensive study, six weeks on tour, where they gain experience in teaching, serving, and sharing the good news. And then three months in Uganda, Africa with Uganda Kids Project and Calvary Chapel of Shunga over there, serving um, life on mission in a foreign context. Now, if ever there was a time when young people need instruction in worldview and application of Scripture, it's now. Amen? You see where our culture is going. And I say we should stand up all the more. Listen, there's, there's, our brothers and sisters are dying all over the world in Afghanistan, Iran. They count the cost every time they leave the front door. I could die today. If I accept Christ, I could die. Do we live like that? Church, may the Holy Spirit give us power to live like that. Eternity is all there is. I'm going to have one of the students come up and share a little bit of testimony of what God's doing in his life. You guys woke up, Ian. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm just so happy to be here. Uh, joyful, truly joyful to be here. Um, uh, I've just been thinking, I got baptized when we were in Salt Lake City. Um, it was kind of like uh, spur of the moment, as things can be sometimes on the road. Um, but uh, Pastor Terry was just talking about how uh, it's like a past tense. You, you're baptized um, uh, for the remission of sin, as in because Jesus has offered you the remission of sin, uh, you get baptized. Um, and that was sort of his message. And that really spoke to my heart because all I have to offer is uh, everything Jesus has given me, which is my life. Um, I woke up today, and I got to come here, and now I get to say uh, the words that he's given me to share with you guys. Um, and praise God. I, <laughs> praise God. Um, so, yeah, I would just encourage you. I think Dave actually said 90% of, of what is on my heart today, um, that uh, it, it's, it's you that he wants, all of you, um, and uh, it's not about knowing him with your head. Like, uh, I was just talking with the team the other day. I knew him all growing up. My parents are strong, strong believers, so I saw him working in their lives, in and through them, and I still didn't get it because I just knew him. I didn't, uh, I just knew about him, you know, and I didn't know who he was, and I really just didn't believe him. It's unbelievable, you know? Why would he want me? Why does he care about me? And that didn't, uh, it never clicked until it did, and then he changed my life. Um, and so I was looking at, you know, uh, baptize uh, word definitions because I'm a nerd. <laughs> and, 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 but it, it means to be overwhelmed. Um, and I don't know, maybe do they say this in church, but overwhelmed is like to be made fully wet. Um, <laughs> but like dipped, you know, it, immersed, submerged. And um, that's, that's how... I want to live my life, so that's why I made that decision to, to be baptized, to make a public declaration of the fact that um, there's, nothing, there's no one else to be in relationship with, just him. And then from that, relate to the world, relate to your brothers, the lost, um, go out and, uh, yeah, spread the good news, you guys. Um, yeah, he's changed my life, and um, I love him. I'm just going to share this from 1 Thessalonians because it's so good. Um, it says, uh, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful and will also do it. <laughs> Praise God. Praise the Lord. I know I'm running a little bit late. Is that, I'm going to 
I just want to read some statistics to you guys real quick about where, the, where this generation is at. And we pray that God will redeem this generation. Amen. And Barna Group research shows that there's a, bib- a, a biblical worldview is on the decline in America. That's pretty obvious. Only 4% of Gen Z, that's those b- born between 1999 and 2015, have a biblical worldview. I'm sure it's less than that. 47% of millennial Christians believe that it's wrong to share their faith with someone who has a different belief. I don't find that in my Bible. 71% of Christians don't think it's their responsibility to share their faith. 95% of Christians have never led someone to Christ. 80% admit that they don't witness to others around them. And less than 2% are involved in the, in the ministry of evangelism. Listen, that's crazy. That's not the book of Acts. If God has changed our lives, why aren't we telling people about it? Press through the boldness. We sang this morning, just, God, how you are everything to us. If we is, then we will go and tell someone, not by our own strength, but we will wake up in the morning and say, Lord, use me. Use me, God, please. This world is perishing. And so you can pray for us, please. We want to raise up the next generation that will be bold in, in the face of adversity, that God would use them mightily. Our hope is that these students will come away from this time able to give an answer to the tough cultural questions that their generation faces with grace and truth and to live life on mission. Whether they're going to be a plumber or a pastor, it doesn't matter. You, you have a sphere of influence that only you have, right? Whatever God calls you to, whatever your occupation is, that's because the gospel needs to be there. That's why you're there, wherever you're working. And that's what we want these guys to see. So please pray for us. There's a couple ways you can get involved. You can refer a young adult to our program, um, or if you're a young adult and you're thinking about what's next in your life, come. Come get trained up. Come spend time with Jesus. Uh, you can sponsor a student for the 10th Hour Project. We keep the tuition very low so that we can get every student that wants to come, um, that they might come and be a part of this. Uh, we have a table in the lobby. You can, we have a newsletter. We'd love you to sign up so we can know how to pray for us. But please pray for us. I mean, that's the greatest thing you could do for us is pray for us. Um, from here, we're heading to California. We're sharing the gospel all along the way, every gas station, every fast food place, everywhere we go. Someone's going to hear about Jesus. And then these guys are heading to Uganda from L.A. So please keep them in prayer. Amen. Thank you guys. So much.